The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Everyone, uh, so uh, this is Richard Hip, and uh, I think uh, the best way to describe him uh, quickly is that pretty much everybody in this room has used free and open source software created by him. Let's hands up if you've used Firefox. Any? Okay, we can stop right there. <laughs> That's everyone. Okay, um, uh, he's best known for SQLite uh, and Fossil, which this talk is about. And the Southeast Linux Fest this year would not be possible, in fact, without Fossil as we use it exclusively for all of our internal organization work. So uh, without further ado, Mr. Hip. Thanks for that introduction. It's been a great conference so far. I've really had a good time this time. I hope you guys have too. I'm going to figure out what to do with this. So, um, Fossil, a distributed version control system. Yet another one, like we need another one. Yeah, huh? Yeah, there's because this is really popular uh, these days. We've got this whole distributed version control system thing kind of got going with um, Monotone. Has anybody here heard of Monotone? Familiar with that one? A couple people. Have you used Monotone? Not many people have. But um, Git, you all know Git, right? And everybody, probably everybody's used Git maybe a little bit. Uh, Mercurial, Mercurial users around. How about Bazaar? Who's done Bazaar? A lot of people use Bazaar. Well, really, Monotone was kind of the first one, and um, and they they pioneered a lot of the concepts here. And then uh, Linus was actually looking at using Monotone for the Linux kernel, but he decided to write his own instead. And then Mercurial and Bazaar kind of followed them. Um, but do we really, you know, these these kind of cover things pretty well. Do we really need? another distributed version control system? Well, uh, you know, I, I developed my, spent most of my time working on SQLite, and I felt like SQLite did, because these other version control systems were not meeting my needs. So, um, I wrote Fossil specifically to meet the needs of the SQLite development that we're doing, and if other people find it, use it, uh, find it useful, that, well, that's just great. So, um, but why should you pay attention to this? I mean, you're not, you know, necessarily developing with Fossil. Why do you, uh, developing on SQLite? Why do you care? Well, a lot of people have found that as Fossil is useful for themselves, and so you might be among that group. Um, I'm also going to talk about the, some of the advantages of distributed version control versus the older concurrent version control that you might be familiar with. Uh, if you're a developer for Git or Mercurial or Bazaar or Monotone, maybe you can steal some of my ideas because Fossil has some concepts that none of these others have in them. And finally, uh, uh, it's sort of a cottage industry to disparage any distributed version control system, which is not Git. Uh, Git has a really, really devoted fan club, and uh, anything that's not Git is, is, is deemed as bad. So uh, if you want to find some, some, some facts with, by which you can disparage Fossil in your blog, then this is a good place to come. So, right now, the version control systems are kind of divided into these two categories, which I'm going to call concurrent and distributed. And the concurrent is your older CVS and Subversion, and the distributed are the new ones, Git, Mercurial, Bazaar, Monotone. Now, uh, there are other categories as well. I mean, old timers like me can remember uh, the systems like um, SCCS and RCS which were not even concurrent, okay? That means that you know, you can only one person can be editing at a time. They were really, so people these days are, speak very disparagingly of CVS, which was kind of the first concurrent version system. And in fact, that's what CVS stands for, concurrent versioning system. Um, but if you've had to use the prior systems, you know, yeah, CVS does have its issues and it does have weaknesses, especially compared to the modern ones. But if you had to use the ones that came before, you can never bring yourself to say anything bad about CVS. It was such a wonderful thing when it first came out. Um, 
of course, the, the world has moved on. Now, but, but now we're, we're kind of focused between this, this big divide here between concurrent and distributed. And the big difference here is that with a concurrent system, you've got a central repository, a master repository that's on the server that has everything. And then people check out just the parts they're working on. Whereas with distributed, everybody has a complete copy of the entire project history there on their local machine. Well, this gives you some advantages. Uh, among them is that with distributed, you kind of get this automatic backup scheme because everybody has the complete copy. If you lose one machine because of a disaster, you've still got other machines with all your developers and, and they, can, they can recreate the entire history from that. Um, because everything's local, you're not doing as much network traffic and a lot of the operations run a lot faster. Uh, you, distributed works disconnected. I can do useful work with the distributed file system when I'm on an airplane or when, it, or when I'm in a place where I don't have connectivity, which is a lot of places. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the concept we see here. To build this further, uh, we've got a picture here of Bob and Alice and they're working on a project and they're, they're using a distributed version control system and this could be Git, Mercurial, Fossil, whatever. And I've got this little box here which kind of represents the repository and that's all of their complete files, that every, everything about the whole project, going back, say, 10, 20 years. It's all in that one little thing. They all have their own private copy. And that means that if Alice gets disconnected from the network, she can keep working. Now, if you're using sub, uh, Subversion or CVS and you, you get disconnected like this, you could keep working on the files that you happen to have checked out, but you can't check in stuff, you can't bring in old stuff, you can't do diffs with some historical versions. You're kind of cut off. You're kind of blocked from working. But since you have everything locally, Alice could keep right on working, checking in new changes and, and that sort of thing, even though she's disconnected. And then later on, um, her connection gets restored and she can synchronize her, her changes with one of the servers in her cloud and then that server would synchronize with the other servers and then eventually that would get down to Bob and everybody gets all synced up after the fact. This is a very useful concept. This is the disconnected operation. Now, the other big thing I talked about was the necessity of backups. I mean, machines are increasingly reliable. I mean, two decades ago, you always had at least one machine crash and lose data every quarter, at least one, okay? And now they're a lot more reliable, but you still have machines that are failing. And this is, um, you know, you talk about backups and things, sometimes the backups don't work like you want. Here, this is an actual news blurb from Linux Weekly News two years ago. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the Savannah Project. They were doing regular backups but the RAID array was going bad while they were backing up, and so they lost all kinds of stuff here out of their uh, version control system two years ago. And here's another uh, uh, news blurb I, I pulled off of the Firebird SQL site uh, a year and a half ago, where they had a similar situation. They had a, a network attached storage machine, and they were doing their backups right and everything, but the machine was slowly failing without them realizing it, and they were backing up faulty data. And so they both lost a lot of stuff. It was a big problem. And this sort of thing still happens. So now, but if you have a distributed version control system, and, and once again, I'm talking here about all of them, Git, Mercurial, uh, Monotone, Bazaar, Fossil, they all work this way. If you, you lose a machine in your, in your system, you just replace that machine with a brand new one. And then it automatically synchronizes and you're right and, and everything's back to normal. There's no need for this, there's no need for a system administrator to run backups, there's no need for a backup policy, there's no, all that hassle. It, you don't need to mess with any of that. I'm gonna talk more about this later on. The key features though that are part of distributed version control that I really like are the automatic backup and the disconnected operation. You're going to hear me coming back to this again and again. So if you're using Subversion, you're not getting this, but you're going to want it. Now the other thing that you hear people talk about, the difference between distributed versus 
concurrent version systems is this whole concept of the cathedral versus the bazaar. This is going back to Eric uh, Redmond's paper about you know, the different development model. And people kind of think that, well, the concurrent uh, versioning system, CVS version, because they've got the central repository and it's centrally planned, that's sort of the cathedral model of development. And, but uh, the distributed version control, because it's kind of chaotic and stuff is all over the place, that's the bizarre method of development. Now, it's the implicit statement that bizarre is, is better, and, and, and I'm, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, I don't, the bizarre is not good for, in every circumstance. Uh, in particular, I don't want to be using the bizarre model, as uh, Eric Redman calls it, when I'm doing SQLite, because especially with SQLite, with, with, with many applications that are like on your cell phone or something, if there's a bug in the software and it crashes, no problem, it automatically reboots and it comes back up. And the fresh copy is going to run okay. But with the storage system, a bug, because the storage system is, is, is remembering things, if there's a bug there, it's going to remember the mistake. And you can't just fix the problem by rebooting because it remembers. And so quality control is really, really important to us. And uh, the, the bizarre model doesn't really work. We need, we need to be really accountable. And we're also in the public domain, which means that we have to be able to track every, every single byte of code to know where it came from so that we don't accidentally introduce uh, code that is under copyright. And Actually, that's where our revenue comes from for our company is that we sell contracts to big users of SQLite that just essentially guarantee that we're not going to let any contaminated code get into the product so that we can guarantee that it's going to continue to be in the public domain. We sort of sell uh, uh, copyright liability insurance, you might say. So my thinking was, you know, I really like the automatic backup. I really like the disconnected operation. Why can't I do that? and still follow a, a cathedral type development model? Why do I have to switch to Bazaar in order to have these really cool features of the new distributed version control systems? And so that is sort of the genesis of the whole idea behind Fossil, which I started working on around 2005, about the same time Git came out. Um, but I was working on it kind of slowly because I had some other things going on. And Fossil became self-hosting uh, almost um, four years ago. We immediately put the SQLite documentation on it. It's been there three and a half years. SQLite got cut over about two years ago. Um, some other projects have come on board. A big project, uh, Tickle TK, adopted uh, Fossil as their distributed version control system uh, earlier this year. They were form they've been on CVS forever and ever. They were using SourceForge. And uh, back at the beginning of the year, SourceForge got hacked. I don't know if you remember this story. Uh, there was a big hacking event, and they shut off CVS, just shut it off cold. And Tickle TK was sort of left in a lurch, and uh, they had zero development for a month while they were scrambling around trying to figure out what to do. And there was a bit, there was a lot of contentious discussion. And I'm, I, I used to be a bit active in the Tickle TK community. Actually, SQLite, we, it's a, it's a SQLite is a Tickle TK extension that escaped into the wild. But uh, I'm sort of an alumnus of that community now. Uh, but uh, but they, they, they asked me to look at it, and I, I supported them with it, and we made that cut over just this past year. So here's some things about Fossil that make it different from what you might have seen before. Well, Fossil isn't just version control. It also gives you a wiki. It also gives you bug tracking. It also gives you blog features and online documentation. And all of this is versioned, just like your code, and it's also distributed. So you can like work on your, you can file bug reports while you're on the airplane, and then when you land and sync up with your coworkers back at the office, those bug reports will appear on their system. Or you can make changes and notations on bug reports. Oh, I fixed this one. I fixed this one. I was over the Atlantic. Okay, and and then when you land and sync up this will automatically go in and, 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 and become part of everybody else's um, uh, repository. 
In fact, the Fossil website, which you can visit at www.fossilscm.org, is just an instance of Fossil. Everything you see on this website, with the exception of the download page, which is a separate thing, but everything on this website, all the documentation, all the links, is just Fossil. If you clone a copy of Fossil in its self-hosting repository, you don't just get the source code to Fossil, you get the whole website. And I'll show you, a little, I'll, 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 if we have time, I'll demonstrate some of this for you. So another way that I like to think about Fossil is it's GitHub in a box. Who's familiar with GitHub? Who has GitHub projects? Yeah, a few of you do. Now, you know, of course, I, I get a lot of pushback with this claim because people say, well, the thing with GitHub is the social community, yada, yada, yada. Well, yeah, that, but um, I, I'm not going to argue with that. But uh, really, Fossil is giving you a lot of the features that GitHub provides, but it's kind of built in, it's kind of integrated, so that you can kind of set up your own private GitHub. Now, of course, you could go to GitHub and pay them seven dollars a month and get your own private GitHub and then it'll be hosted on you know their servers but or you could set it up yourself by using Fossil. Um, we've got three Fossil repositories uh, for SQLite out there sort of our personal cloud. Now these are the ones that I control. I've got two um, and part of you know the part of the companies paying us to support SQLite one of the contractual requirements we have is that we have to keep uh, geographically dispersed copies of the code for a disaster recovery type situation. So I have three different machines, uh, one of them Fremont with Hurricane Electric, and two Linodes, Linodes right outside the door here. Uh, I've got a Linode in Dallas and another one in, in New Jersey, right across the river from New York City. And uh, there's fossil instances of, of SQLite running on all three of these, and they automatically synchronize. So you can push or pull from any of those instances and they'll automatically kind of link up with the other guy. And we've got you know, all the documentation, all the wiki, all the ticket tracking, that all automatically synchronizes too. So if uh, an earthquake takes out Fremont, you know, we're cool with that. If um, Texas finally decides to, if Texas finally decides to secede from the union and, and it cuts all the internet connectivity, well, we're cool with that too. I mean, we got some, we got some redundancy here. Um, so, like I say, we've been using uh, Hurricane Electric and Linode for a long time. I'm going to show you just how simple it is to set up with Hurricane Electric. The Hurricane Electric account is a $10 a month shared internet hosting service where we just have CGI. We don't have full shell access. Well, well yeah, we do got a shell, but we don't have root access. We can't run services. We can't uh, run uh, demons on that machine. All we have is CGI. So, to set up Fossil, on Hurricane Electric, all you do is, well, first you have to uh, put your repository there, uh, step one. Step two is you have to have the fossil binary there, and you can either compile it yourself there on their machine, or you can download the binary and just put it in your bin. And then you have to enable CGI. This might already, it might already be enabled for you until you can skip step three, but here's the two-line thing, two-line script in um, Apache to turn CGI on. And then you create this CGI script shown on these two lines down at the bottom. You've got a shebang, which is just the, the uh, fossil binary, and then you've got a one line thing that shows you the file name, which is your repository. Okay, now you, at this point, you can point your web server there and you've got a complete website up and running, ready to go. Um, now for the automatic synchronization, uh, a simple cron job takes care of this. I, I do a little shell script and it, it just runs Fossil and says sync with the other guys. And then I, I set up a cron tab that uh, I've got mine set to sync every, once every three hours it does a sync. You can do it every 10 minutes if you want to. Three hours is, we, we only do about three check-ins a day on SQLite and so that's, that's plenty. At 43 minutes past the hour, every third hour we synchronize all of the, the machines like this. Now. So this is a really, really simple setup, and this is given a version control, tickets, wiki, documentation, the whole bit. Oh, sure, you can do the same thing with um, uh, Mercurial or Subversion. You know, you can pull in all these little extensions, not Subversion, um, uh, uh, Git or Mercurial. You can pull in all these extensions that they have, and they will, do, they will let you do all of this stuff too. But 
you know, you've got to have a bunch of Perl scripts and a bunch of Python and stuff to kind of glue it all together. And the point with Fossil is that you kind of, it's, it's a toaster. It's, you just, you plop this one binary there and that's all you need. There are no dependencies. Makes it a lot easier to administer. Um, the other, which leads me to the next distinctive feature of, of Fossil, which is it's a standalone binary. Um, I, I've been listening to a lot of people talk uh, th this week, and a, and a big issue people have is installers and making sure people are, are, are coming up to me and saying, oh yeah, well, what, what, what my company does, we build this thing that makes sure that all of the dependencies are satisfied when they install, you know, or if, um, uh, um, I was talking to Mad Dog, and he was talking about how we need support because people might install an application and it messes up another application because it overrode a DLL or whatever, and this gets really complicated. Well, uh, with Fossil, it's not. It's just a file. Okay, you, you download the file, you the precompiled binary, you put it on your path, and you're done. If you're security-minded, there, there are no dependencies. If you've statically linked it, you can put the Fossil binary in a change root jail and it runs. You don't have to copy all of your shared libraries into the change root jail. You don't have to have Python on your system. You don't have to have diff. You don't have to have patch. You don't have to have Java. You don't have to have any of these other utilities. Everything is built into that one binary, which is about uh, half a megabyte. So it's trivia to install, update, and uninstall. If you know you want to try it out, download the binary, put it on your path. Oh, I hate this thing. REM and it's it's out of there. And you also don't need to be, have administrator privileges to install it. So here's the website. You can go there. Uh, if you have your laptop open now, you can just download one of these things and try it. We we have builds out for Linux, Mac, OpenBSD, and Windows, or you can get the source Starball and do it yourself. This kind of plays into our whole concept of we want it to be easy to use, because I hate doing system administration stuff. I hate that. I want to just, and you know, at this point, I, I, I talk about SQLite as, I, I wrote Fossil for SQLite. I've actually got dozens of projects that I'm tracking using Fossil right now. And I don't want to have to go around and duplicate a huge pile of Perl, Python, Tickle, scripts, whatever, and get a setup going on each machine that's one of my servers. Next feature of Fossil is kind of web-oriented. Uh, that's the, the, the user interface. There's, um, once you get Fossil installed, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, you type Fossil UI, and it brings up your web browser, uh, your, your preferred web browser, and it gives you a nice little user interface there that you can just click on and, and surf the history and get a lot of information about that. It's got a web server built into this little standalone binary. It's ready to use with CGI. If your server doesn't happen to have a web server on it that supports CGI, you can configure INETD or XINETD or whatever the latest thing is for, you know, dispatching processes when an inbound TCP IP connection comes in, and it'll just run it directly. It's got a very rich interface with the timeline that gives you situational awareness. Here's a screenshot of uh, the, uh, what you would typically see when you do Fossil UI. Uh, and this is uh, some months old. And I actually zoomed in on this in the next slide because I had made the assumption that at these talks they would be giving us a projector that had 640 by 480 resolution and I thought you wouldn't be able to read that previous one, but this is actually a really nice projector. So, um, but you can zoom in and you can kind of see the kind of information that you would see in a, uh, a typical um, uh, repository. This is a shot from the SQLite repository. We've got a change here on, this is from last summer on July 7th, uh, there was a check-in, you know, strengthen the assert on malloc, you know, and there's another check-in that was derived from that. And then here at 2226, uh, uh, you know, 10 o'clock at night, the, all these, because my development team for SQLite is international, people around the world, all of these times are GMT. So it's not really that late. but. At that point, I, we branched off, and, and there's several different things we tried to work around a problem. And it shows the development progressing with time. And then we merged things back together and got back onto the main line up there on, uh, on July 26th. And there's lots of hyperlinks on this that we can click on. Oh, I went the wrong way. So 
the big thing here is situational awareness. I mean, quality is very important to me. I want to be, I'm tracking a lot of different projects all at one time. I'm sort of the manager. And I want to know what's going on on all of my projects all at the same time. And this timeline feature lets me stay aware of what's happening because I don't want to lose situational awareness. One of my favorite slides of all time is the scuba divers and the shark. They think everything's just fine. Lately, there's been this insurance company, Chubb, that's been running this ad, which I thought was just great, you know. Don't lose situational awareness on your software because when you do, you're, you're going to overrun schedules, you're going to have run into quality problems, and thoughtful is that situational awareness means understanding what's going on around you. Don't be surprised. Understand the status of what's happening, what people are doing. Anticipate what is coming up next. And, and know what your team is doing. Now, Fossil gives you a lot of things to promote situational awareness. The timeline is, is kind of the key thing. Uh, anybody here use track with subversion? A few people? You ever heard of CVS track? No? Never, it's, it's, track was, uh, was kind of a copy of CVS track. I wrote CVS track a decade ago to give me a timeline to do exactly this sort of thing. And the track people saw that, hey, that's really cool, but I want to rewrite it for in Python for subversion. And, and they did, and, they, and it actually does look a lot nicer, um, a little bit slower, a lot more dependencies. But this timeline feature turned out to be a very powerful way of tracking your development. And so I wanted this timeline. But with the, the, with the screens and, and Fossil, you've got the ability to look at timelines on a per branch basis. You can look at timelines for a file. If you've got a single file in your project, you want to see how it's evolved over time, you can look at that. Uh, what individual users have been doing. Uh, per tag, I mean, if you've got a particular tag, if you tag every release with just, say, release, you can look at all your release history. You can look at diffs between branches, between versions, between check-ins. You can look at annotated histories. There's a lot of information you can get, get access to here simply by clicking on your screen, which I, at least, find very useful for keeping track of things. And you can do all of this, of course, with the proper packages that you use to augment Git and Mercurial, but with Fossil, they're kind of built in. So Fossil has a single file repository, which is an SQLite database. So um, Fossil depends on SQLite, cannot exist without it. SQLite depends on Fossil, cannot exist without it. You can ponder this problem for yourself later. But it's, it's a transactional back end. So if you're doing an update and you lose power or something like that, um, it, it's atomic. And so you're not going to corrupt your repository. Uh, before we do any check-in or before, anything, before there's any change, everything's done inside a transaction. And Fossil goes through and does all sorts of internal self-checks to make sure that it can always re-extract your content before it actually commits. So if there's a bug in Fossil that causes a problem that might corrupt its internal representation of your historical files, you're not going to lose anything. It will see that problem, and it will roll back and give you an error. Uh, there have been a couple of bugs over the past five years which would have caused us to lose data if it had not been for that mechanism. Uh, one, uh, um, Fossil is cross-platform. Well, you say, well, so is Git and Mercurial and, and these others. Well, you know, I'm going to claim Mercurial is not cross-platform. It's single platform. It only runs on one platform, and that platform is called Python. Okay, and Python is a virtual machine which happens to run on a lot of other platforms. So, but, it's, you know, but really, Mercurial, has, is, it, you know, it runs on the Python platform. Uh, uh, Git, it's been ported to Windows and stuff, but Git, the, the feedback I'm getting from people on Windows who've tried to use Git is that they're disappointed. Um, I, I, Git really wants to run on, on Unix. Fossil runs on all of these things. Somebody ran it on Android the other day. It's not clear to me why you want to get your, but um, if you go on the mailing list, you can look this up, and somebody has, has run it on Android. Um, you know, I've got an old um, PowerPC iBook uh, that I use because I need to test SQLite on a big Indian machine, and that's kind of the only big Indian machine around anymore. 
and, and I, I run Fossil there so I can download the latest SQLite code to, um, uh, to, to test it on a big Indian machine. It's really slow and old, but it still works. And finally, and, and this, is, this, this is surprisingly important to a lot of people, Fossil is the only distributed version control system that is not GPL. It uses the two calls Berkeley license. And, you know, I don't really care, but some people really do. Some people get really uptight with GPL and a lot of businesses and then and people tell me that, well, you know, we, we're not allowed to use anything that has a GPL on it. And I say, well, it's a command line tool. It's not like you're integrating it with your product. I know, but the lawyers say, well, you know, yada, yada, whatever. And so here's a two call, here's a, a BSD license option for those of you who are in that situation. So, quick tour of Fossil. If you want to start using Fossil, you want to play with it, the first thing you need to do is produce a repository. And I'm going to give you four ways to generate a Fossil repository. You can do Fossil init, just type the command Fossil init, and then the name of a file, that file name will become your new repository. It will be empty. It will have a generic name like unnamed repository or something like that, which you can change but it will be an empty repository. Uh, Mercurial and Git work the same way. Or you can clone an existing repository and make a copy of it. And we use uh, a URL syntax to specify the other repository to join, uh, to clone. Um, you can give it you know, using HTTP or HTTPS, it supports them both, or file, or it'll also work with SSH. So you can uh, clone things that way. Uh, if you have an existing Git repository, you can use the Git fast export facility and then pipe that into um, Fossil import, and it'll take your Git repository and turn it into a Fossil repository. Also goes the other way. So if you try Fossil out and later on you decide you don't like it, you want to go back to Git or something, you can re-export and import back into Git. Or, you know, if, if you... Um, happen to just have a repository that you can just copy, make a copy of the repository file. It contains everything you need. Now, this is not recommended because the repository also contains a lot of information that isn't versioned, such as uh, passwords for logging in on the website and that sort of thing. And if you want to copy that stuff, then just copy the file. But if you're running a website and it's got all your developers' passwords on it, this is not something that you want random users off the internet to be downloading. So. You know, there's a little bit, a little bit of caution there. It, it does. Uh, it's not storing the passwords directly. It's storing a hash of them. But, but these days, if you've got a hash of the website, you can generally do an exhaustive search on the passwords, and find it in a few hours. So after you get your repository, the next thing you need to do is produce a checkout. You do, you do go to your working directory, and that can be anywhere. And then you say fossil open and give the name of the repository, and that gives you a, all the files that you're going to be working on. And a feature of Fossil, which is missing in Git and Mercurial, is that you can have multiple checkouts associated with a single repository. In Git and Mercurial, the repository and the checkout are kind of the same thing. There's the .hg or the .git directory, which is, it, which is your kind of a date, is your repository, really. It's a database. It's a pile of files database. It's not using a real database engine. And, but, but that means you can only have a single checkout at a time. I find it's very useful to have multiple checkouts on different branches or different points in time. If I'm wanting to do some uh, uh, performance studies between um, the previous release and the next release of SQLite to make sure that I ha haven't hit a for performance regression, I'll check out one, you know, the previous release uh, you know, in one directory, and I'll also check out you know, the head of trunk and the other, another directory, compile them both up and do some studies that way. This turns out to be a very useful thing. Now, you can move around your checkout to different versions, different historical commits using the update command. Type update, fossil update, and then give the version name. Now version, there's lots of different ways to specify a version. So we're going to talk about this briefly. Here's, for example, well, the, the one thing, if you've not done the, the distributed version control systems before, if you've just been doing Subversion and CVS, you're probably used to doing file or version numbers like 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1, like that. Very sequential, very easy to remember. Because the distributed version control systems can be, things can be committed uh, with pe without a central authority there to assign version numbers to things, we have to give them 
strange version numbers, which are typically a SHA-1 hash, 40 characters of hex. They're not intuitive, they're not, it's not sequential, uh, they're a little bit hard to deal with. This is, this, is the, this is what you're giving up when you go to disconnected operation. You have to deal with kind of funky version numbers like this. And all of the distributed version sy systems work that way, but you, can, you don't have to always type all that stuff in. This version that you type in, it can be any unique prefix of that SHA-1 hash. Or it can be the name of a branch, in which case it'll give you the most recent check-in on that branch. Or it can be a tag, or it can be a date timestamp, in which case it'll give you the most recent check-in that's after that date time. It can be a branch name colon and a date time stamp, which means it'll give you the most recent check-in on that branch that occurred after the date and time. Or it can be like keywords like next and previous to kind of move up and down in the, in the history. Any of that will go, go there. And so you do that. So here's an example. Um, suppose I wanted to check out uh, that release there in the middle. And I, I've got a couple blow-ups of this page because I had previously assumed that um, we'd have a low resolution uh, projector. But here on this one line on the timeline, we've got version 376 of SQLite. And I've identified four different names by which I can call this. I've got the first 10 characters of the SHA-1 hash there at the beginning, version A. And, and so I could do a fossil update and I just get the first six characters, which is unique. And that would take me immediately to that checkout. Or I could go over here under tags and look, or this, this thing is tagged as trunk because it's on the trunk branch. And so I could say, uh, give me, or go to the trunk that is um, prior to April 11th at 2, 2 a.m. Now I had to specify time there because if I just say fossil update trunk, it's gonna go to the very latest check-in on the trunk, and which is not what I want. I want the check-in on the trunk that's back in time a little bit. Likewise, we, we, we put a tag on every release of SQLite called release. So there's multiple check-ins that have this release tag. Um, and I had, and so you can, you can say fossil update release, but I have to give it a timestamp of some sort or it's gonna give me the most recent release and this is not the most recent one. So it gave me a timestamp or the, we give it a tag version 376, which is unique and so I can just go with that one tag. So there's lots of different ways that you can specify checkout. Uh, once you have something checked out, you can do fossil UI. It, if you're already in it, if you're in, sitting in a checkout when you do this, it just automatically brings up your web browser. Here's a hint, Who's on, who uses Mercurial? Anybody have contacts with the Mercurial team? No? All right, Mercurial has this, this same thing where you can do HG space serve. And it kind of starts up a little mini web browser right there for you. And then you can take your web browser and point at it and you can look at some stuff. But where Mercurial falls down is it one, you have to tell it what TCP IP port to use. Or I, maybe it defaults to 8080, I'm, I'm not sure how it works. But Fossil will actually go through and find a free TCP IP port. So you can do Fossil UI in three or four different uh, uh, X terms, which I frequently end up doing. And because they're all running, they've got to be on different TCP IP ports and it'll find a free one and do it. And then it automatically launches your web browser. So I don't have to fumble around with a web browser and type stuff into, the, UR, into the, the, the URL bar. I just type fossil UI in my shell and up pops my web browser pointing immediately to my, my uh, 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 information. It's, it, it binds only to the loopback address so I don't have to worry about other people coming in. And it automatically gives me an administrator login. Now Fossil also has, you can also do Fossil Serve like you can with, a, with Mercurial, and in that case it binds to the uh, all um, uh, IP addresses. And, but, it, but then it doesn't disable the, the logins and so people have to give a password. So you do Fossil Serve if you want to kind of run a server for ad hoc sharing. All right, so once you, once you get the, um, so you can look at the UI and see what's going on. You've got the usual commands, you know, add files, remove files, move files around. Add remove means it, it kind of looks at your entire uh, checkout and if there's any uncommit, uh, it, 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 it adds files that need to be added and removes files that have gone missing so that it kind of synchronizes your checkout with, with uh, what's in the repository. 
There's fossil status, which shows you, you know, what's the status of the things in your checkout. Shows you the changes. The diff gives you a, a, a diff. A G diff, I said fossil has no, no external dependencies. It doesn't require diff on your machine. G diff is a graphical diff. And for that, you have to say, I want you to use this external graphical diff tool. You know, TK diff or G diff or whatever. And, and you have to configure that because fossil doesn't know what your external graphical diffing tool is, what your preferred one is. And so you have to tell it that. But, um, but the differ is built in. And when you finish making your changes, you do a commit. And this goes into the repository. And there's lots of options to commit. You can give it a branch name. You can give it a background color. You can say this is a private check-in, which I'm never going to share with anybody else. Um, give it a commit message. It'll prompt you for the commit log message. Um, if you don't, don't I, I usually just let it prompt me for one. Now, once you get things committed, you can push or pull uh, with, with other uh, repositories. If you don't specify the URL or where you're pushing or pulling, it uses the one that you most recently did. If you just cloned a new repository and you try and push, it automatically tries to push back to the place where you cloned. Now, Fossil has this idea of a automatic synchronization. With, 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 with Git and Mercurial, I think, I think Bazaar has this too. Anybody use Bazaar? They have this concept as well. So, and this is on by default. If, if ever you do a, a uh, before you do an update, it'll automatically go out to the last machine that you pulled from and see if there's any new information out there. So I've been away from the office for a day now. I'll go home and I'll do fossil update on SQLI. And it'll first go out to the servers that we saw earlier and see if there's been any changes. And it'll pull in all those changes to my local thing and then it will do the update operation. So it, it's kind of a one-step thing. I don't have to pull separately. Similarly, if I do a commit, it first before it does the commit, it does a pull to make sure that somebody else hasn't checked in ahead of me. And then after I commit, it pushes that back out to the server. It tends to keep the server in synchronization with what you have here. This prevents a lot of needless forking and branching that you get in the other systems. It works a little bit more like CVS of subversion, where it keeps everybody in synchronization. It doesn't always work because people can still work disconnected and you can still get some forks, but it works really well. It's on by default. You can turn that behavior on and off at will. If you want to do a branch, you just commit and you tell it the branch name. Interesting feature of Fossil is you can branch after the fact. Here's, a, here's, a, um, here's a, just a demo project that I did. I just did, uh, you know, it started out with an empty repository, I did two check-ins, and let's suppose that that second check-in, uh, EF1C, I really wanted to go into a different branch, but you know, when I did the commit, ah, uh, I messed up. I, I didn't, mean, didn't mean to go into the trunk. Well, I can just click, I can bring up Fossil UI, I can just click on that little hyperlink there, and that takes me to a screen that describes the second check-in. And then down over here under other links, I've got edit. And I can click on edit then. And that takes me to a screen here, which allows me to do things like edit the name of the user that checked it in, edit the commit comment, edit the check-in time. But also, I'm going to zoom in. It allows me to set a new background color, uh, which could be propagated forward or just for that one check-in. And it allows me to enter a new branch name. So I could go up here and enter, for example, uh, a new branch demo. And I'm going to give it some background color just kind of because I like my different branches to be different background colors to kind of keep them separate. And then I press apply. And what that did, it didn't really change the, 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 the tree of commits, but it, it displays them differently now. It moved that se second check-in into another branch. Now, Fossil has this idea that uh, it never changes history. There's no rebase command in Fossil. And so it doesn't really change things. It just it, it, it uses the accountant's principle. You don't make changes, you make corrections. The original is still visible, and you can go back and look and see what the original branch was. It just makes a correction to it. So then suppose somebody else comes along and they put another uh, commit on the branch there. Um, and so now we've got like two diverging 
versions here, and you want to go back and you want to bring these back together. The way you would do that, and if, you, if, you, if you're familiar with Mercurial and Git, you're, you already know how to do this, of course, but if you're in the subversion world, this might be new to you. The way you do that is you first update over to the branch, and so your local checkout has all the files that are associated with the branch, and then you do merge trunk. Where I have written trunk there, that can be any version identifier you want. Trunk is convenient, it's going to give me the, the, the top of that branch. And that, that pulls all the changes in, merges them together nicely. You should probably test it now, but then you do commit, and that'll merge all those changes together. And you get a nice little graphical display of this, where it shows that it, it merged the changes from trunk into your new commit there. Now suppose I wanted to close that branch out completely. I could go back over here and I could um, update to the trunk and then merge demo one into trunk and then commit again and that would merge the demo one into the trunk like that. Familiar to you if you're using Mercurial or Git, if you're used to the CVS world, I, I found at my experience with the Tickle TK crowd who had been CVS for decades, um, this was really confusing to them. It took them a while for them to kind of get their head around this process. And, but I think that to be able to see this graphically and by default really helped them a lot. Uh, some other features of Fossil, you can type Fossil Help, it gives you a list of commands, Fossil Help command name. A really cool thing is this Fossil All command. Fossil has, uh, it's got a dot file in your home directory and it keeps track of all the repositories that you have. And you can, you can push and pull to all of your repositories with a single command. This is really useful for me because I'm working on a desktop system which is a Linux box and uh, I'm constantly automatically syncing to a server which is those three servers that I showed you earlier. But then I go on the road sometimes to visit a client or to come to a conference and I take a MacBook with me. But I, the MacBook sits over in the corner, it's not used most of the time. But when I'm getting ready to go on the road, I just go over to my MacBook and I bring it up and I do fossil all pull. And it knows about all of my repositories and it goes down and automatically pulls down all of the information from all of my repositories. I develop this talk on my desktop and I push it up to the server. And then before I come to the conference, I just do fossil all pull and it pulled all the slides for this talk into a repository of all of my talks on my laptop. Now, while I'm on the road, I will typically make some changes to a, a talk or something like that. And I, I, you know, I'm in the Marriott, so I don't have Wi-Fi in the room. And so then I do, um, uh, you know, so I, I make the changes. I check them in locally. But then when I get connectivity again, I just do, I get home, I do fossil all push, and it pushes all my changes back up to the server. Very convenient way to keep things in synchronization. Some other features. We talked about, it's got the built-in wiki, which automatically synchronizes when you do push or pull. It's got embedded documentation. Uh, I thought it was going to be short of time, and so I didn't go into a lot of this. We can demonstrate it to you later, if you, or after, after the talk, if you want. We've got tickets, trouble tickets, bug reports. There's the ability to do blog entries. You can customize the look and feel of the, uh, of the, of the web screens. Uh, I want to emphasize that it's, it's, it's robust and reliable. Nobody has ever lost, in the five-year history, nobody has ever lost any content after it's successfully gotten into a fossil repository. Now, a couple of weeks ago, there was a big, big blow up on the internet where this guy, Zed Shaw, was trying to check some things into fossil, and he hit a bug in fossil. And what fossil did is it went through and deleted a bunch of files in his checkout. Now, it retained all the files that he had actually changed. The files that it deleted, were files that were unchanged that he could recover easily enough from the repository. The files that he had edited were retained. But it saw, he saw it deleting a bunch of files, and that was a bug, but he saw it deleting these files and then he panicked. And he entered a bunch of other fossil commands which ended up deleting files that he'd actually edited and he'd lost work. Now, the other commands that he entered actually asked fossil to delete his work, okay? And he, he was in a panic. And there, it, was, it, was a, it was a cascade of errors here. Um, there were multiple points along the way where he could have recovered from it, uh, but, but he, there was a big blow up about that. But he never actually got his content into the fossil repository when this happened. Um, 
once you get into the fossil repository, as far as I know, nobody's ever reported any loss of content. What are people, uh, so fossil has been self-hosting since uh, 2007. We've had, well, as of uh, the middle of last month, we've had, you know, 2,700 check-ins, 406 uh, source files. Uh, there's about, about half a gigabyte of content. It compresses down to about 15 megabytes. And if you clone the fossil repository, it's about 9.6 megabytes of traffic just to clone it. Uh, SQLite, we've got 11 years of history, uh, over, over 9,000 check-ins. Um, when, when, uh, two years ago, when we first transferred SQLite from CVS into fossil, at that point, the CVS repository was 320 megabytes. Uh, now, two years later, with a lot of changes, we're at 29 megabytes for the fossil repository. Um, a single checkout is about 19 megabytes uncompressed. If you clone the entire history, it's only slightly more than that 20 megabytes. So, of course, it's obviously compressed, but uh, that seems to be pretty good. Uh, Tickle has been, we've got 13 years of history, of Tickle history in there. Uh, there's 12,000 check-ins, um, uh, five gigabytes of content, and an 81 megabyte repository. Uh, NetBSD has been tinkering around with this. They have not actually, they, they're on CVS right now. They have, they're looking at, at, at um, configuration management systems. They, they need to get off of CVS. They recognize this, and they haven't decided what they're going to do yet. They're kind of looking at Git. They're kind of looking at Fossil. Um, they like Fossil because it's, it uses the BSD license instead of GPL, and there's some bad blood there, you know? Um, that's, that's the one thing I've got going for me. Um, uh, but their, their, their repository is absolutely enormous. They've got, what, 100,000 files. Their com a total checkout is 328 megabytes. And yet it works. So it, it's able to handle some, some large packages. Fossil versus Git. Um, Fossil uh, gets a lot of little programs. Some people say that's an advantage. I don't, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, Fossil has a, a, a single file repository versus a pile of files for Git. But Git has a huge community, and uh, the Git community is fanatically devoted to Git, too. And so if, um, if you've got some people on your team and they're in that Git community, you may get some pushback if you try and go with anything other than Git, and, okay? I'm just, I'm just saying. Uh, GPL versus the BSD. Um, Git, you've got the web interface tools. They're built into Fossil. Git is a little bit complicated. Everybody admits this. Uh, if you want an easier approach, look. In, in, if you don't want to use Fossil, but you want something easier than Git, at least look at Mercurial. Um, uh, I have never been able to find any documentation on the Git file format. Does anyone know where that is? I have no idea. The Fossil file format is specifically designed to be long-lasting, enduring, I, I put, I, I, the words I use in the documentation is designed to be used, or read, used, and extended by people who are not yet born. And it, it's, it's, it's explained in excruciating detail. So it's, um, it's designed to last. Uh, Git does the file versioning only. Fossil includes all this other stuff. What are people saying about this stuff? Well, you know, here's some quotes of, from some things people have been saying about Git. Um, Git approaches the usability of IP tables, which is to say utterly useful, unusable unless you have the man page, tattooed, man page tattooed to your arm. This next one is my favorite quote of all about Git. You're going to love this one. The simplest, it's simplest to think of your Git repository as a point in a high-dimensional code space in which branches are represented as n-dimensional membranes mapping the spatial loci of successive commits into the projected manifold of each cloned repository. If you understand that, then I submit that Git is the right configuration management system for you. And you know, and, and the real irony is the guy who wrote this, it's not in jest, he's serious. <laughs> Here's the link. Here's, uh, We've been using Git and GitHub for a few months, and it's not intuitive. I'm hoping somebody will come up with a set of standard wrappers, GUI, to make it bearable. So, in contrast, you know, I'm getting comments like this from Fossil. Fossil mesmerizes me with simplicity, especially after I struggled to get a bug tracking system to work with Mercurial. Uh, 
Uh, we run a large university to manage code with small teams. Uh, you know, I, you know this, is, this is a direct quote, by the way. This is, I haven't edited this in any way to correct the typos in the email message. Um, uh, with small team rights, the runs everywhere, ease of installation, and port it, I think I meant to say it runs in everywhere with ease of installation and portability is something that seems to be a good fit with the environment we have. Highly distributed, <laughs> uh, very restrictive firewalls. We are happy with it. Teaching uh, master of science and PhD students, uh, it's been a smoother ride than Git. I have heard a lot of people tell me that um, Fossil is the only uh, distributed version control system that they can get to work through their restrictive corporate firewalls. The other ones tend to assume kind of a clear channel through HTTP. One of my several hats, I'm in a small team which uses Git and it goes on to describe pages of frustration which I omitted for you just to say thanks for Fossil making my life a lot easier and for not having a misanthropic command line interface. So that's a quick overview of Fossil. Uh, there's the website there if you want to learn more about it. I think we probably, I have five minutes for questions if there are any. I also have stickers, fossil stickers, if you didn't get a fossil sticker. The question is, are there conversion utilities for converting from, from repository formats other than Git? Not at this time, though I have left provisions in there to do this in the future. Uh, the thinking at this point, uh, and, and it seems to work out pretty well, is that the Git fast export format, um, kludgy though it is, has become sort of the lingua franca for transporting information between the various um, repositories. Uh, there, there, are, there are definite issues with Git fast export, but, but everybody seems to understand it. And so typically what you do is you export from one configuration management system to the fast export format and then import into another one. That seems to be what everybody's doing. Another question was right here. Uh, so the question is, uh, you know, I'm fossil is self-hosting. It's and and what what is my logic? What is what is my decision tree for determining when I take the latest fossil code and stick it on the server? Um, you know, it's stable enough that I don't really work, worry about it. Um, I uh, I build it on my local Linux desktop first, and uh, and then I I run a couple quick smoke tests, and if everything seems to work. I just go up to the server and I recompile it there. And because I've got SQLite underneath it that's giving me this transactional behavior and I've got all these self-checks built in, I hash things every way imaginable. I'm using SHA-1 and MD5, okay, to prevent a common mode failure, okay, and, and, and I've got all of these lots of different hashes that have to check out. And if anything doesn't work out, it doesn't commit the transaction. So you really have to work hard and have a really, really, really serious bug to damage anything. And so, you know, occasionally there are bugs that come up and, oh, I can't check out anymore. Well, I'll rebuild and, 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 and do it and uh, fix the problem and, and get it going again. But that's pretty rare. It's, it, it seems to be really stable. So typically, typically what's running on the server is maybe one or two check-ins behind what's actually in the tree. If you, if you look on the website, down on the very bottom of the page in the lower left-hand corner, there's the, the date and timestamp for the version that's running. Two minutes for more, more questions. If there are no, oh, another question? Well, uh, the question is, why do I use the CGI version rather than just running uh, Fossil Serve on the host environment? Well, one, Fossil Serve has to be restarted and have to mess around with all of the startup scripts. Two, if I'm running on something like Hurricane Electric, it doesn't give me that option. On Hurricane Electric, all I have is CGI. 
Okay. As far as I know, Fossil is the only full-featured configuration management system that can run on a shared hosting environment like Hurricane Electric. Everybody else, you have to be able to start an, your own server. I don't have to write my own server it, or start my own servers. It'll run purely out of CGI. Further questions? Thank you very much for your attendance. And I, the keynote is next, so I guess they need to start moving the walls out, huh? Thank you very much. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.